It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a special pleasure to speak to so many members of the scientific community of the future, because that's exactly who you are, and I hope you think you take that role seriously. Um, I hope you enjoy um, that role as well. One never really knows how one is going to be introduced, so I figured I would introduce myself a little bit. I am a cell biologist. I work, as he said, on the structure and function of biological membranes. I'm at Brown University in Providence. We work on things like, in this case, the structure and organization of the endoplasmic reticulum membrane, part of the cell that's involved in the synthesis of proteins. And my lab was one of the very first to visualize the channel, which is now called the translocon, by which proteins enter the ER. That sounds very technical, but it was a very important problem in cell biology. Um, over the last few years, collaborating with a terrific guy named Joseph Levine, I've written a whole series of high school biology textbooks which are widely used around the country. The Elephant Book, but we have a couple of other books as well, including the Dragonfly Book, which is, which is the most current book. And these are used in probably 35% of the high schools in the United States, um, which is a nice thing. My own daughter, in fact, Tracy, I have two girls. The oldest one is a wildlife biologist. The youngest one is a high school history teacher. And Tracy, the younger one, had to suffer the indignity of using her old man's book, the elephant book, in freshman biology in high school in Dighton Rehoboth Regional High School in Massachusetts, where we live. And I still remember um, one night, Tracy comes home for dinner, and we're all sitting around the table, and she says, you know, Dad, because of you, I'm the envy of everybody in the high school biology class. And I thought that was really cool, because I thought, it's so rare the children ever compliment their parents for any reason whatsoever. And I thought this was one of those moments. And I threw my chest out and I felt really good. And you saw how big that book was. And Tracy then went on and said, yeah, I'm the envy of everybody in the class because I'm the only one who doesn't have to lug that thing home at night. <laughs> because the other kids said, quote, on Tracy does it. My dad wrote it. I got a copy at home. I don't have to bring it home. That was, that was what we were good for, what we were used for. Um, a couple of years ago, at the urging of quite a few people, I wrote a book on evolution and religion. Um, which is called Finding Darwin's God, and the subtitle of that is A Scientist's Search for Common Ground Between God and Evolution. I think there really is a great deal. And as it turns out, that book uh, has been a surprising success um, in terms of not just my publisher, but also people writing to me and saying that what I wrote about here in here about science and religion connected and connected with them. Now, evolution, as I'm sure you all know, is a controversial topic in the United States today. And just to pick one U.S. state, certainly not the only one where it's been controversial, um, I'd pick the state of Kansas. I actually spoke in Kansas just a couple of weeks ago. And some of you may know that seven years ago, the Board of Education of the state of Kansas voted to entirely delete evolution from the state science requirements in Kansas. They simply took it out. Um, that led to a popular outcry. These are newspaper headlines from the Times, and people were confused as to what this meant. What do we teach now? Um, a lot of people thought that this was a controversial issue. Therefore, the schools were best left without it. Since then, every time there's been a school board election in the state of Kansas, evolution has been the issue on which the election turned. In 2004, an anti-evolution majority took control of the board, and they, they rewrote the standards. Back in 2000, a pro-evolution majority took control. This year, it looks like a pro-evolution majority will regain control of the board and they will rewrite the standards again to make them consistent with the national science education standards. Kansas isn't alone in this. It turns out there are a lot of states in which evolution is indeed a major issue in the election. One of the candidates for governor in the state of Michigan right now has made evolution and something called intelligent design one of the key issues in the governor's election in that state. So we see this literally all around the country. And you might say that we live as a result in very interesting times. Some of you, if you read the newspaper closely, might remember that a few years ago, there was a county in Georgia called Cobb County. And Cobb County is not a rural county. It's the second largest school district in the state of Georgia. They adopted new biology textbooks. And the school board thought they were so dangerous that the textbooks had to have a warning sticker pasted on the inside to tell students that evolution was just a theory, not a fact, don't get worried about it. And you might wonder, my God, what textbook was it that was so dangerous that it required a warning sticker on the inside? And sure enough, <laughs> that's the book, and this is what the warning sticker actually said. And the sticker said, this textbook has material on evolution. Evolution is a theory, not a fact, regarding the origin of living things. 
This material should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. And I remember when that sticker went on, a reporter for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution called me up, and she said, Dr. Miller, aren't you outraged at the sticker they've just put on your book? And I thought about that, and I've wondered, why did she phrase the question that way? And then I realized she probably wants to write an article with sort of an inflammatory headline. She's trolling for a quote, and she wanted to write an article that says, author slams Board of Education, or author is outraged, or even better, northern author criticizes Board of Education. Something like that would go over well. And I decided I would not give her that satisfaction, and I wanted to have some fun. So I said, no, I like the stickers. She said, you do? And I said, yeah, I think the stickers are great. They just don't go far enough. And she said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the book has material on evolution. It's got a lot of other material, too. Is evolution a theory? Of course it is. One of the chapters in my book is called Evolutionary Theory. So, of course, it's a theory. But when you say it's a theory, not a fact, you make it sound like theories and facts are opposite things, as if you're either one or another. And that's not the way we understand theories in science at all. So, for example, I, I explain, let's suppose that a young person went to the University of Georgia and decided to study physics. One of the courses they'd have to take would be a course in atomic theory. Now, why do we call that atomic theory? If we get really certain about un some atoms at some point in the future, will we change the name of that course to atomic fact? Well, the answer is, of course not. We call it atomic theory because a theory is something that explains hundreds of thousands of facts. And atomic theory explains observational and experimental facts about the nature of matter. Evolutionary theory, in the same token, explains hundreds of thousands of observations and experimental facts relating to the nature of living things. That's what a theory is. But I told her that the sentence that really bugs me is the last one. And the last one says, this material, that means evolution, of course, approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. And she said, what are you, against open-mindedness? I said, no, you don't understand. You know what that third sentence tells students? It tells students we are certain of every single subject in this book except for one, and that's evolution. Now, I don't object to that as an evolutionist. I object to that as a cell biologist, because apparently what that tells you is if you study ecology, you don't need an open mind. And if you study biochemistry, you don't have to study carefully. And if you study cell biology, you don't have to apply critical analysis. And in fact, everything in science should be approached that way. So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. No charge. I'll rewrite the sticker for the Cobb County Board of Education. They can use the new sticker if they want. So the way I rewrote the sticker, as you can see right here, I would phrase it, this book has material on science. Science is built around theories which are strongly supported by factual evidence. Everything in science should be approached with an open mind, studied carefully, and critically considered. That's the right way to consider it. Alas, they didn't take me up on this. They stuck with the stickers. They got sued. They went to court, and they lost. And the stickers were ripped out at the end of last summer. Now, even if you haven't taken a course in biology, you probably know that if you open just about any biology book, and mine is a pretty good example, you'll very quickly come to a chapter which tells you all about evolution. And we have this sort of thing as well. Why is it? Well, many biologists would say very simply that evolution is the central organizing theory of the biological sciences. A very famous biologist once wrote that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. Other people have said that without evolution, biology is just stamp collecting. Now, what they meant by that, and I used to be a stamp collector, so it's not a slur on stamp collectors, is that without evolution to tie things together, the characteristics of organisms are just a bunch of isolated facts. And what evolution actually does is to show how those facts fit together. So how do you explain evolution? I was thinking about that when I was preparing to, to meet you this morning. And one way to do it would be the way that Charles Darwin did, which is to write a book. And Charles Darwin explained evolution in The Origin of Species, depending upon the edition, um, that it's uh, about 400, 455 pages. So one good way to spend much of the time in this lecture w would be for me to open page one and start reading The Origin of Species. And I hope that at some time in your life, I'm not kidding about this, every one of you